the winner here in 2013. And uh, Dula, the quickest of all of them, in the purple there, the former Ethiopian running for Bahrain. Looking quite comfortable as uh, Tom Payne does such a good job taking them on the nice, steady tempo. Looking for around uh, 74 minutes, 74 and a half minutes at halfway, and they too are inside that at the moment, as indeed uh, Wanjiru looks strong, almost uh, in contact with Tom Payne. Kales has dropped off. She's going through a bad patch in the background there, top left of picture. That gap's about 50 metres. They're on a downhill section now, and they really are striding out strongly. So 11 miles gone for the leading ladies, and the race beginning to be sorted out now. Well, the leading men passing the pier and the aquarium roundabout. Kangor is struggling, losing a little ground on that uh, quartet up in front. The man who won in 2013, but he does know the course well. And a similar story in the ladies' race, too, uh, with uh, a former champion chasing a small group. The men approaching halfway, indeed through halfway now. Kango on a bit of a charge. He's had a bad patch, but he's coming back. Well, in the ladies' race, as they approach halfway, Panina Wanjiru, the debutante, is running aggressively. Dula, the quickest in the race, just beginning to struggle. But can Wanjiru hold on, or has she misjudged it for the second half with Kales some way back, the former champion? Well, the sixth Brighton Marathon unfolding nicely. The second half lies ahead for the elite athletes. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Brighton Marathon, a weekend of running that culminates in this, the first big spring marathon of the year. Now, whether you're an elite or one of the masses just enjoying the party, the race is now well underway and there is no turning back. Well, the elite athletes, men and women, now attacking the second half of their race in this sixth Brighton Marathon. And ahead of them, about 10 minutes before the start gun, a cavalcade of vehicles set off, a series of minis and scooters and Harley Davidsons, a mass of vehicles warm up the course with lots of fun and high-fiving going on. Way behind the elite, though, back in the early miles of the race, the masses are easing their way into their Sunday morning run. And two of them are truly fascinating characters. Madeleine Pirard, an opera singer of international renown, and her husband, a conductor, Michael Joel, who are taking part for a very worthy cause. And what a tough challenge she has already experienced as Madeleine. When I was six years old, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I was in isolation for nearly two years, having chemo. At the end of it, yeah, when I went into remission, my mother was told by one of the doctors that it was highly unlikely, basically, that I would ever be able to have kids. And quite a few years later, decided that I wanted to have a baby. And somehow, miraculously, with no intervention at any stage, I was able to become pregnant and give birth to a very healthy girl. Since I had my baby, I kind of feel like I've already done something I never thought I could. Now I'm going to try and do something else I never thought I could. Running is something I've always thought totally beyond me. And um, the idea of a marathon seemed like the worst form of punishment in existence, but it's sort of my way of giving back, I guess. My husband Michael is a very athletic person. I am not, by any stretch. My wish for the day is that I can complete the whole thing without having to walk. I would love that. And I would love to do it in less than five hours. But I mean, I'm not trying to do an amazing time or anything, I'm just, I'm after completion. Madeline, Michael, how's it going? It's okay at the moment. So our opera singer and our conductor, husband and wife, you're looking good, you're gonna to run together all the way, Madeline? Oh yeah, yeah, for as long as we can, yeah. <laughs> well, she's got a long way to go as Madeline. The worst kind of punishment she can imagine, but everybody's volunteered for it this morning. Athletes of all shapes and sizes running for literally hundreds of different charities associated with the Brighton Marathon, including the Sikhs. How is their day going? 
well easing along the seafront with uh, many miles behind them. And the crowds giving them so much support after the local publicity they've received. Guys, come in, how are we going? Very tough, very tough, we're very good. It's really hot today. I underestimated the uniform. <laughs> but it's amazing. making it a bit harder, no? A very amazing crowd, brilliant crowd keeping us going. Well, they're acknowledging the support from the athletes all around them, the Sikhs back on the seafront. But meanwhile, uh, the elite athletes ploughing along, and it's Kip Kemai and Mayo now, with Kangor still chasing hard, just a couple of seconds down. He is closing, as has been the case for uh, the last 20 minutes or so as they go through this third quarter of the race. The tiny figure of Kangor with that bouncing, aggressive stride. Well, that's the first time I've seen an elite athlete choose to grab a two-litre bottle of water, but uh, it seems to be uh, doing the job. Kango taking that opportunity to ease into second place. Ahead of uh, Duncan Mayo, who is back into his stride now with the bottle discarded. But this is tough. They've gone through halfway much, much quicker than was planned. 63.49 at halfway. They were looking for 64 and a half minutes, so sub 208 tempo through to 13 miles and beyond. They're now at around uh, 16 miles, single file, and it's a war of attrition from very, very early on. Relatively speaking, there's many miles yet to be covered. These are ideal conditions for elite marathon runners, though. Good flat surface, long straight stretches. You can get into a steady rhythm where your body can reach its uh, Optimum equilibrium, so to speak. Well, Penina Wanjiru has built up a 13-second lead on Lishandula. She's passed halfway now. And uh, that 13 seconds is actually built up pretty quickly, within the space of uh, about a mile and a half. 73.45 was her time at halfway. Inside schedule. And uh, Lishan here beginning to suffer, Lishandula. She is the quickest in the race, the 28-year-old uh, Varanian. Third in the Asian Games back in 2014. She's got plenty of experience. Well, locked together in combat are the men uh, in the second half of their race as they turn right onto Grand Avenue, head back down to the seafront for the final time. They've still got some uh, seven miles or so to go. And again, another surge going in from Mayo in the light blue. This is a slight downhill section. They've had huge crowds for the previous few hundred yards. Sometimes athletes who are inexperienced allow the adrenaline to put a surge into their legs, so to speak. He's only raced once outside Kenya in his life, this man. And maybe he's never experienced crowds of this sort of size. Trains with a very experienced group of elite athletes, 206 runners, Kogo and Kiptu and Mike Keegan. Could this be the decisive move? Well, Duncan Mayo moving strongly, and he's built up that lead at that far western section of the course near uh, Shore and Power Station. He negotiates that turn. A little glance over his shoulder there. And you can see that the pressure is still being applied by Kangor, the former champion, the 25-year-old who knows this course. He knows what's coming up in these remaining four and a half miles. This is where the racing starts. Now, the marathon itself only lasts a few hours, but the action goes on all weekend. So we've been having a little look at what it is that brings the masses to the south coast. It is indeed not just about the marathon, it's about the BM10K, the mini mile races and the Brighton Marathon exhibition. Tom Naylor is the race director and Tom, this is the sixth year now and every year this Brighton Marathon weekend is getting bigger and bigger. Yep, we've been very lucky. We're getting a reputation for the sun, reputation for having really nice um, 
lovely atmosphere. The big thing behind the Brighton Marathon weekend was we didn't just want a marathon to start nine o'clock, finish at two o'clock and people go home. We really want people to come and enjoy the city, come and enjoy the full weekend. So by having the exhibition for two days, meaning anyone can come and, and get part of that atmosphere, that excitement. And every runner has to go through the exhibition, collect the pack. It's full of all sorts of fun stuff. There's a seminar area we can go and learn. All those runners sharing their experiences. The exhibition's like the first step in, in their marathon journey. It's just great seeing the kids out there enjoying being fit and active. And it's a real sort of festival of running this whole weekend. It's brilliant. Last year, the 10K was the second fastest in the UK, which is brilliant, first time out. So fingers crossed the wind dies down a little bit. And then we're looking forward to a good, fast race. And yeah, 2,500 people, which is great. Well, the BM10K is starting at 8.30, 45 minutes before the marathon, and Andy Lemoncello amongst the favourites. It's all going to be, I think, about the weather. You know, we've got great Brits to be running against. You know, this wind's going to be a big factor, but we've got this last 2K going down the road with the wind behind, so that's going to be screaming fast, and I'm just looking forward to that part, to be honest. Want to go for a win, of course, and, uh, you know, sh show that I'm back. Well, unfortunately, Lemoncello didn't win. The victory went to Johnny Taylor. Lemoncello was fifth, while uh, Steph Twell won the women's race ahead of a star-studded field. I'm really excited to race up against Ali Dixon and Helen. They've run really great times over this sort of distance, and Ali ran fast time here last year, so I think the course is going to be fast. The city's alive. Like, it always is normally at the weekend, but even more so. Like, the fact that everyone's going to be more swinging towards the seafront, yeah, I think it's going to be great. Well, two miles inland, the infrastructure of the marathon at Preston Park is given over to the youngsters for the mini-mile races. Thousands of them. Two and a half thousand, I believe, are taking part just today in these kids' mile races. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic to have 17 kids' races today, two and a half thousand of them, so they can be part of this marathon weekend. This is the future. This is where we could see some future Olympians here. We're very determined to make this race, the mini-miles, as cool as possible. The park looks amazing. The event village is just great. And, and you know, it's about the running, but it's also about coming and cheering on your mates and coming and hanging out with family. And it's just a great way to kick off Brighton Marathon Weekend. Well, the mini-mile races provide a challenge, an opportunity for all children, boys and girls, aged from 7 to 17, to take part in a one-mile run. And some very special young boys and girls in there, none more special than little uh, Ferris Whittingham. Diagnosed with cerebral palsy as a youngster, and along with sister Caris, they are running for Sussex-based charity Whoops a Daisy, based in Preston Park, who provide individual rehab for children with physical disabilities. Their mother, Bethan, is a special character too. Now this is Ferris and he's seven, and this is Caris and she is eight years old. And both um, Caris and Ferris have cerebral palsy, and this year both of them are going to be running the mini mile. I like to do the mini mile, uh, and I saw my sister Caris do it, and I thought I want to do that. She did, yeah. I um, wanted to raise money for Whoopsie Daisy, and last year I raised about £2,000. We found out that, that Ferris had cerebral palsy when he was about two. It means that he isn't able to stand on his own, so he uses his walker. And um, with steps, he can do a few steps on his own, but it's quite a challenge because he hasn't got the sort of strength to do that. We heard about Whoops of Daisy, which was a very small charity, Brighton Race charity, that provides conductive education. So Caris used to go and um, every week, and it's quite a structured routine. You learn how to sit and learn routines and standing. I used to go there when I was a ba baby, but um, I don't go anymore because I learned to walk when I was about three or so, and I go and help my brother. And so Dina Minimal is going to be your challenge for him. The fact that all his friends are doing it, he wants to take part and be part um, of everybody else. But he's determined to do it, aren't you, Ferris? Yes. <laughs> Well, a very affirmative but calm yes there from young Ferris, who charged round the one-mile circuit with as much enthusiasm and gusto as anyone. And international racer Andy Lemoncello urging this astonishing young man all the way to the finish line. Well, and for Ferris, as for every finisher, a handshake, a medal, and that uh, warm sense of satisfaction at a job well done. What an astonishing young fella.
And his sister Karis too, enjoying a, a journey, a loop round Preston Park at quite some tempo, running this year a minute faster than last year. The applause was long and loud for her as well. Will you come back next year, Karis, with your brother and race again? Yeah, I would love to come back again. And run even quicker? Yeah, I will see if I can do that. <laughs> right, so Ferris, tell me, how was it for you? Did you enjoy yourself? <laughs> I ran out of breath, so I had some water to keep me going. I ran down hills and very tight gliding. There and there is sort of like a wobbly zigzag, so I think it was great. Well, he thought it was great, and so did thousands of other youngsters in the mini mile races of 2015. The wind was strong, but that didn't put any of them off. The uh, skies were blue, and the whether they went round fast or slow, it appears that over 2,000 youngsters had an absolutely fabulous day. Well, smiles all round for the youngsters uh, as they got their mile races done. Well, the marathon run is a slightly different challenge. 26 miles, 42 kilometers of uh, roadway lie ahead. And amongst those uh, thousands of starters earlier on this morning, David Rafty and his three brothers were in there somewhere, running for whoops-a-daisy. Uh, David, one of the four, uh, Kenneth, Patrick and Michael in this little domestic challenge or family challenge, munching a smile there. And that's because his son Dylan goes to whoops-a-daisy. And of course, when you run a marathon with uh, a real cause, something you're passionate about, you can uh, enjoy the race that much more. But let's see how he's getting on. Catherine has caught up with him on the seafront. Patrick, David, come and talk to me. How are you going? Yeah, we're doing great. So far, so good. It's a great atmosphere. I'm starting to struggle a little bit with the knee. It's a great cause, isn't it? Remind well, me quickly say, again. Well, it's about whoops and daisy and about conductive education. And it's about getting people that don't have the access and the privilege to do this, to be able to move like this, to get them moving. You're about halfway. And, uh, okay. and a couple of the family, though, they've been flying, David, I have to tell you. Well, you know, they're always, they're the runners. I'm the best looking one and it's clear, you know, we all know that. Let's go, come on. <laughs> 